Very good power shapes and fluids electromagnetic properties. And the work is being done with Professor Janopoulos. So yeah, my name is Edward, and today I'm going to be doing a presentation on pyramid power, how shapes influence electromagnetic properties. And really the myth of pyramid power began in the 1970s when uh, many, much of the Eastern wisdom had been brought to the West about meditation and you know all these you know psychic powers or whatever else. And people thought by meditating at the center of pyramid they can enhance their you know cognitive abilities. Um, also, MythBusters did a little uh, show on this pyramid power: how to keep fruits and vegetables and water purified under a pyramid. The pyramid is actually related to the Earth, harmonically coupled in proportion, which we'll find out more about later. But it's the geometry that's really important about it that kind of relates it to uh, complex harmonics and much of what we do in music and also in electrical engineering. There is a lot of rumors out there that th this is actually an electrostatic cavity uh, shape capable of uh, containing you know, negative ions at its center. There's a lot of research being done on this, how to actually harness the negative ions at the center of the pyramid to create what's called the pyramid battery. And that's what I'll be doing next semester, essentially busting or confirming this myth. And um, we're going to discuss a little bit how the Great Pyramid is related to the Earth. Now, the Earth is host to many pyramids, hundreds if not thousands of them. You should look up Chinese pyramids and Russian pyramids, there are a lot out there. But uh, the pyramid is from the Greek word pyra, which means fire, and mid from miden, uh, which means uh, in the middle. And pyramids employ a knowledge of astronomy, but also geometry as well. Uh, geo referring to the Earth, and metri referring to measurement. The hieroglyph pernetor attributable to the uh, pyramid is pernetor, uh, which meant house of nature, interestingly. And the Great Pyramid and the Earth are actually harmonically coupled in proportion, and uh, also in their mass, uh, in terms of magnitude, but not order. Uh, they also face, or their, you know, the pyramid is aligned cardinally, and also the uh, location of the pyramid is at the geocentric center of the Earth's landmass, which is at the Giza Plateau in Egypt. Now, a little into the geometry and complex harmonics, you know, connection. Kepler's triangle um, is actually having a base of 1, a height of square root phi, and a hypotenuse of phi. And phi is actually the golden ratio, which is the Fibonacci number, uh, as I'm sure, you know, you've been exposed to at some point. But um, Kepler determined, Johannes Kepler determined that this uh, triangle actually permeates throughout nature, uh, but also could be used to determine the geometry of celestial bodies. So that's in a platonic solid kind of, you know, Copernican, you know, model of the universe. And the way we determine or derive Kepler's triangle is through squaring the circle. Uh, geometrical techniques, so if you were to take the Earth as a circle and find a square whose perimeter is equal to the uh, circle's circumference, what you get is a relationship for the radius to half the base. So a, re a relationship between that circle and that square. And that happens to be square root phi exactly, or 4 divided by pi is an approximation the Egyptians used. And if you actually take the radius of the moon plus the radius of the Earth at its polar region, uh, and divide it by the radius of the Earth at the equator, you can do this yourself, you actually do get square root phi. And that's what Kepler's try trying to talk about. That's what Newton knew, and if you ask me about Newton later, I'll explain how he derived his gravitational constant with it. Now if you divide the uh, two acute angles in the pyramid, uh, you actually get a pretty good approximation for E. Uh, e is Euler's number. It's used in you know music and uh, you know geometry, I guess, also in electricity, or, and it's, it follows the laws of you know complex harmonics, like architecture in general. As Goethe said, you know architecture is frozen music, and the Great Pyramid's frequency is actually equal to its angle of inclination, so 52 hertz. And sound EM waves at that frequency will provide coupling. Uh, you know constructive interference will also step up power. And uh, just looking at some of the theories out there on the Great Pyramid's electromagnetic properties, a lot of uh, electrical engineers have kind of understood, especially actually chemical engineers at MIT have discovered that the outside casing stones were not actually natural limestone at all, and that they were actually fabricated with a geopolymer that covered their, its surface. That could actually contribute perhaps to the uh, capacitive abilities of the pyramid. Uh, electrical engineers have also found that the uh, north and south shafts in the King's Chamber are actually hydrogen line waveguides optimized for microwave transmissions in the uh, um, 21 centimeters in, you know, in width and in height. It's a waveguide, and we'll discuss more about that later. But Joe Parr, the inventor of the gamma ray transducer, actually um, tried to show how a pyramid in an alternating magnetic field can create like what he called a pinch-off bubble around it. 
which would essentially block out any EM radiation, okay, and is powered by the uh, microwave and gamma ray transmissions that are natural in our universe. And uh, if we look at the King's Chamber closely, we actually realize that it's the only part of the pyramid that's quartz granite in nature. And quartz is, of course, piezoelectric in nature. Um, and that means kinetic energy can be transmuted into electrical, and it does this through sound, because sound creates pressure, and pressure induces kinetic energy in the you know, crystals embedded in the walls. Now, the cavity resonators, there are five cavity resonators above, they actually help step up the power. Uh, why? Because uh, you know, each one is tuned to a different frequency, and you know, if we study this more in detail, we'll find out exactly how you know, the king's chamber and the, the five slabs above are, are related. Now, uh, this is moving kind of slowly, but here uh, we have the antechamber, which serves as an acoustical filter. It had three porticolous slabs that were on rope and pulley, and it actually is used to filter out noise that's coming in from the grand gallery. The uh, grand gallery is corbelled in nature, so it projects sound upwards. Uh, according to acoustical engineers, and also houses 27 um, you know, uh, holes or slots on each side. Some people believe that it could have you know, housed uh, Helmholtz resonators of some sort. Um, now, this is the electrostatic uh, uh, static cavity, which is the Queen's Chamber. This is what the research is about. This is about how the shape itself could potentially act as not only uh, an ideal antenna, but a capacitor collecting negative ions at its center. And um, here, this is the sub subterranean pit we're coming up to now, and that is actually quite controversial in nature because there are um, impurities that exist uh, in the chamber. There's a lot of, um, how do you say it, um, evidence that water had somehow been pressurized in there, uh, perhaps creating electrolysis or you know, instigating electrolysis. Water would come through the Nile and actually flow into this chamber. There's also a shaft that goes straight down into the earth providing that resonant frequency of the earth, the pulse of the earth, whatever they used, in fact, to, to help sound project itself throughout the pyramid. But just to cut a long story short, hydrogen and oxygen would be produced in the, kings, in the uh, subterranean chamber, and through here, hydrogen would flow to the center of the pyramid as it's negatively oriented at the center, and hydrogen is positive. And uh, oxygen would head or be burped outwards in a pulse pump manner uh, to the uh, atmosphere, which is positively oriented, uh, oxygen being negative.